Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. It's the big Marvel vs. DC special, or like we, well, as we like to call it, the all-new World's Finest Roundup. I am Phil Parrish, your moderator and host, and who are our two warriors who are going to be duking it out, uh, well, verbally so, to prove their universe is better than the other one? Well, let me introduce you. In the first corner, weighing in at none, it's none of your business. She's a lady. <laughs> you can hear her every week uh, reviewing DC Comics with me on World's Finest. And she has her own DC podcast, Channel 52, which I'm lucky to be on sometimes. And coming soon, you can hear us on the new and improved, revamped Newcastle Crew podcast, where we'll be talking everything Constantine. Ladies and gentlemen, this woman, and not Sinestro, is how Jordan's worst enemy, <laughs> the mistress of mayhem herself, Lilith Hellfire. Hey guys, so happy to be here, so happy to talk to Charlie, because he is like the guy for, uh, you know, Marvel over here at Southgate Media Group. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, in the other corner, weighing in on anything and everything... <laughs> you can hear me. You can hear him with me every week, uh, reviewing Marvel comics on the all new Marvel Roundup podcast. And you can hear us discussing, well, basically whatever's on his mind on the Super Connectivity podcast. And he's going to be uh, reviewing the original Incredible Hulk TV series uh, soon with Dave White on uh, 80s Reboot Overdrive. Ladies and gentlemen, the professor himself, that walking encyclopedia of Marvel knowledge, Charlie, the professor. Professor Esser. <laughs> you can't see this, but I'm like doing that thing where you put your hands together and shake them over your head. So <laughs> <laughs> why I'm doing that on a podcast, I don't know. But <laughs> one of my many, many mysteries. Uh, all right. Well, for, for those of you at home, uh, little Charlie and I came up with, with six uh, topics for the two of them to duke it out over. And... Well, we came to the decision because I had the thought that whoever goes second is going to have a little bit of an advantage. So we're going to flip a coin here pretty soon to see. Well, whoever wins the coin toss can decide if they want to go first or second, just like the NFL. But uh, <laughs> and I've uh, numbered the questions one through six. It's going to be a roll of the dice here. So uh, completely random order. And I know what you're saying at home. Well, Six questions. Could we have a tie? Well, we have a tiebreaker if we need it. Wild card. Oh, yeah. And we'll flip again for that if we need to. But, uh, <laughs> are you ready? As ready wait, as wait, hold be. on. Phil, what? people that listen to, like, um, <laughs> us for the DC side, like, wait a minute. Should Lily really be doing this? Doesn't she hate DC? <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, I don't That's okay. hate DC. That's okay. Everyone hates DC. <laughs> Okay, let's. Get, uh, I love DC. You guys know I just I have issues with the new Fifty Two universe thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. All right. I pulled out my replica uh, Two Face coin, so uh, I'll flip it. Uh, uh, let's see, Lilith. Do you want to call good side or bad side? Bad side. Oh, you got bad side. <laughs> it's my Lex right. Luthor powers kicking in. Yes. <laughs> Uh, wait a minute! You're using a DC coin to decide this match. I'm 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 already I'm already uh, uh, ra raising a protest that this was. I don't have a Marvel coin. All you don't right. have a Captain America on the one side and Bucky on the other side coin. <laughs> I do not. That's okay. All right. So we'll I'm just I'm just going to say that the six sided die is really the um, Soul Stone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. The, the Lost Stone. Oh, uh, let's not get into nipple talk again. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the next super connectivity, folks. You'll get that joke. All right, Lilith, do you want to go first or second on the first one? Um, I'll go first. Okay. And let me roll the dice here. Let's see. All right. For two, which was one of Charlie's picks. All right. First topic, Lilith. Red Hood versus Winter Soldier. Ooh, oh wait. What? wait wait a minute and uh just to tell everyone at home we also agreed uh we're doing four, a four minute time limit on here right mm -hmm. okay sounds good all right i have my i have my phone set when you hear that sound your time is up okay um 
why do I think Red Hood is better than the Winter Soldier? Is that the question? Well, you're well, you're defending you're defending Red Hood. I know hard. It's hard for you, but uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, you can no, think- it's not that hard. Actually, I think that Red Hood is um, over the three like iterations, whether it's the Joker, Jason Todd, or the Red Hood gang, are infinitely more interesting than Bucky. Sorry. <laughs> That's just how it is for me. Um, uh, I-, I like the Joker iteration the best, and then the Red Hood gang is really cool. Um, if we're talking animated universe, that movie was the bee's knees and <laughs> totally turned some things on its head. I just think that... Um, Just in general, the DC is going to have a definitive edge in a lot of these just because they've been in the movie making radio shows and animated cartoons and animated movie universe a lot longer. So there's a lot more to uh, connect and like versus just, say, the movies. (laughs) So, I mean, I guess that's just kind of where I'm coming from. Uh, They took a really interesting approach with the Joker, though. I like how they tried to tie that in and they're like, nope, let's backtrack because, you know, it's comic books. Marvel does it. DC does it. Even the great people at Dark Horse do it. So Um, the Winter Soldier, though, Bucky specifically, uh, he's kind of a boring character. Sorry, Sebastian Stan. Um, Just I don't know. Like, he's just a sidekick and it's just not. He never really, for me personally, like, was relatable or interesting or anything, except for the movie. But I'm just going to say I just kind of ship Chris and Stan and Sebastian together, so that's probably why. Um, But if you take out the the movies, there's really not that many interesting things to talk about when it comes to the Winter Soldier. Um, But what is interesting to talk about the Winter Soldier? Hmm, let me think. Uh, Nothing. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, hmm. I, I don't know. I just don't think sidekicks are that interesting unless it's Nightwing. He just never really got fully developed for me. Um, it was just a very generic story. It's like, oh yeah, we're gonna take this guy. We're gonna make him a Manchurian candidate. That, you know, that in and of itself isn't an original idea for me to get like excited and behind. So yeah, that's all I really have to say about it. I won't drag it out. Okay, so you're done. Yes, I am done. <laughs> Okay. Ooh, with a minute 43 left. Ooh. Okay. Well, I'm going to need that time. Um, <laughs> well, you get the, you get four minutes. So. There we go. Okay. <laughs> let me know when, let me know when I may answer this, Start- this, this, this travesty of injustice. Whenever you're ready. Actually, technically a travesty of justice, a travesty of injustice would actually be a, a good thing as we're undoing the uh, injustice. Anyway, um, moving right along. So um, so first up, obviously, yes. So DC is always going to have the advantage because DC is essentially an infinite multiverse where they are just going to make up whatever they, they need to for any story. And if you want to pick and choose, well, I'm not going to actually, <laughs> I'm not actually going to even address Jason Todd, who is the obvious corollary in discussing um, uh, Bucky Barnes, uh, the Winter Soldier, as in someone who had died and was mysteriously brought back. Uh, So in that sense, yes, DC has the advantage. However, if we actually want to ground this in a little bit of reality of, of what, uh, of what a debate should be, let us just start with, with, with with the very simple reality that uh, the advantage of, um, of, of Bucky over uh, Jason Todd is that Bucky actually has a believable retcon. It does not require, Superman to punch the walls of reality to alter <laughs> one more iteration of DC because they can't quite uh, land on on a reality um, to bring him back into existence. He is actually someone whose body was never found, and so in saying because there was no body, there was no death, as is the classic tale of um, of, of of the hero is 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 quite del- is is. Um, is an acceptable that kind. It does not require a, a. It does not require a Superboy hitting hit, hitting 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 dimensional walls to to make it happen. Um, more to the point, what is particularly fascinating about the Winter Soldier concept, even within the Bucky concept, is how in being a Manchurian candidate, he he embodied something that was unique in the Brubaker um, storyline, which is this idea of of having a character who was 
who could pass between worlds easily. He was this spy, but he was also this American kid. So once you had him convinced who he was, had him convinced in you no know, in this way, in this way, I'm actually gonna say Sebastian Stan in the movie version is actually really not as good of a winter soldier as you could find. The real winter soldier in that first Brubaker idea, where he is the legend of the winter soldier, is that he is this guy who is this American kid who could just walk right into any place where Americans were welcome. Um, have a much harder time nowadays, of course, but could just walk right in, shoot someone, walk right out, and he was the man you didn't suspect. And that was, I think, something something they've moved away from even in the comics. Uh, possibly bringing it more in line in, with the with the um, with the uh, movie variation on the Winter Soldier. Um, and to that extent, I think I think that he is he is stronger. You also have one thing that Jason Todd never could do is, um, uh, or any Red Hood for that matter, really could do is. Um, Winter is Bucky, the Winter Soldier, believably carried the shield for Cap. He is the super, he is the sidekick who moved into the superheroic position, carried it with honor, and 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 ran with it. Um, until of course Cap came back from the dead and, and took it over again, as 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 superheroes are wont to do. But um, in that sense, I have to say that Winter Soldier certainly um stands above just being a sidekick he is not just a sidekick he is a hero in his own right and as they have expanded his backstory is a hero going back into world war ii um making him more than just the kid who wandered into cap's uh tent to being a equally well-trained um uh commando ready to stand side by side with the howling commandos and captain america and fight for freedom and what has jason todd ever fought for really you know even as a manchurian candidate oh time's up there we go uh so how how do i do this uh my my final decision (laughs) um I think on that one, I think I think we can all agree. I think I, I'm giving that one to Charlie. I think Lilith was at a disadvantage because I don't think anyone here is a big fan of the Red Hood. <laughs> right, Lilith? <laughs> Hello? It's grown on me. What, the Red Hood? <laughs> yeah, but they're taking their sweet time with it. it they, you know, it's DC. They're always in transition transition of something. Yeah. Plus, you had to go first. So. <laughs> all right, so... Score right now is one nothing, Charlie. Uh, so Charlie, you're gonna go first this time. Okay. All right. Let me roll five, which is oh the other one you picked. Uh, Marvel Comics best Trinity can be teams. Okay. Well, um, well, I mean, Marvel actually does have their own Trinity, uh, which actually now as as uh, which is of course Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man, who are the core heart of the Avengers, much in the way that the DC Trinity is the core heart of um of the justice league um uh and of course it becomes even much much more appropriate of a trinity now that thor actually is a female um uh giving you that 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 almost direct uh correlation between wonder woman to thor uh the mythical being uh from another world who is here fighting for truth and justice uh you have uh, of course the in, in blue, the, the 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 hero of of an older time, a simpler time, but who understands that the world still needs a hero. Um, interestingly enough, now of course, uh, Captain America flies. Uh, so in that sense, uh, you have the the uh, in, in the Falcon uh, cap. You even have again approaching this idea of both. Um, embodying not only um the idea the ideals of america but even uh in being an african-american person now someone who is at times outside of that american ideal um even as he's fighting for it and trying to make a better world for everyone within that american ideal and of course uh for batman we have tony stark um billionaire genius playboy um although unlike unlike bruce wayne of course tony stark actually earned his money (laughs) <laughs> and continues to and continues to share his technology with the world. Granted, this technology is mostly uh, in 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 weaponized uh, items, but you know I'm sure the police of Gotham might like a batarang or two uh, to help them out with their crime fighting. But of course, that's a choice that Bruce made. 
Um, so yeah, so as far as Marvel's Trinity, I think it is, I think it is without a doubt, um, the core Trinity of the Avengers, uh, uh, Thor, um, either you want to go with old Thor or new Thor or Captain America, either one old cap or new cap. And of course there's only one Iron Man. Although actually there is another Iron Man, which was James Rhodes, um, which if you want to work him into the mix too, that we could, uh, we could, we could find, we could find a way to explain James Rhodes as, uh, as our Batman, uh, counterpoint, um, Although he's a little harder, uh, just because I think James Rhodes, unfortunately, has not gotten as much uh, development. Although I, I suppose as War Machine, again, he comes in as this place of a man who is uh, fighting fighting for justice with the means at his disposal. And sometimes those means aren't pretty. <clears throat> and I don't need my extra minute there. Oh, you're done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, Lilith, do you have a response? Oh, absolutely. Right, right. She gets her four minutes, but all right. Yeah. Well, she she ran short. I'll run short. Okay. Sometimes it's just so obvious. There's not much to say. <laughs> and slapping DC while you're at it. I see. Yeah. Um, but the real American way is to inherit your money. Everybody knows that, and then pretend like you need a uh, a state tax to keep the filthy government hands off of it. Just saying. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, for me, I think Marvelous Trinity are all teams. Uh, I think that's more of a personal bias for me because of the things that I read when I was younger. When I was really into Marvel, it would be X Men, Fantastic Four, and Avengers. And some people might say that's probably surely based on name brand recognition and overall comic book sales. Yeah, it's that too. But X Men was that book that had like a social conscience. Fantastic Four is the first uh, modern day Marvel super uh, hero that is a woman in Sue Storm. And then the Avengers, you know, all the classic tales that go back to that. But, you know, Avengers is kind of was inspired by Justice League, just saying. So maybe that's a thing, too. Um, <laughs> I, I enjoy uh, these books in all the various inter- iterations for various reasons. But I think out of, out of just sheer diversity um, is what makes the, the specific Trinity, like really the true Trinity for me. Um, and well, with the exception of Fantastic Four, X-Men and Avengers are just bl- monster, monster blockbuster hits, whether it's TV or the um, animated universe or the cinematic film universe or, you know, what Fox is over there doing. Uh, they just really resonate with people, uh, have been since their uh, creation, and they will continue to inspire. Um, hopefully, Fantastic Four can get it together with the movie franchise <laughs> one of these days. Um, that's one of my biggest hopes, actually, for uh, Fox, is that they'll get it right one of these days. Um, and I hope that Avengers doesn't uh, overdo it and saturate and make people sick of them, because I think that they're a really fascinating uh, team, because the roster can just be so easily interchangeable. Um, and at a time where Marvel Cinematic Universe specifically needs more diversity, I think that that's what we're going to look to. We've seen it at the end of Ant-Man. They're kind of future for what they want to move forward. So, yeah, that's why I chose X-Men, Fantastic Four, and Avengers as my trinity for Marvel Comics. That's it? Mm-hmm. Wow, I thought I'd have to, like, cut you off. Beans are all, both of you were going short here. <laughs> well, four minutes is actually a pretty good uh, space yeah. of time to use. So, um, Although, obviously, I could have gone on more. Uh, and I think we'll probably go on a little longer when we're defending our own place rather than uh, yeah. simply trying to find our place. So, uh, Lilith, just a quick question. So, um, who is the Batman in the Trinity? Uh, Batman in the Trinity for this one specifically would be, I would say, Fantastic Four. Uh, because they're kind of a family and a bat family and all those things and they're into technology and you know things get rough and they you know they have a go at each other and it's just uh that that's what i think uh for superman i'd say avengers obviously so x-men would be superwoman (laughs) uh superwoman that actually makes a pretty good corollary actually because you know you have gene gray you have professor x you know the all-knowing guy he's still really compassionate helpful they want justice they welcome all people um, they fight for all people, so I think that that's a really good correlation too. <laughs> wow, the winner in my eyes is just I like the her I like little all encompassing uh, view. She made me think, uh, surprised me where she went. So yeah, th- I, this one I think goes to Lilith. Yeah, I like her view too. All right, so the next one, Charlie, you'll go. F- wait, I'll go second in the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lil's going first. All right. Ready to get that one. All right. All right. Lilith. Martian Manhunter versus Silver Surfer. Hmm. Martian Manhunter versus Silver Surfer. 
I actually came to read Silver Surfer first. I really like Silver Surfer. I really hate that the Fantastic Four second um, movie really kind of tarnished that for a lot of people. Um, Because a lot of people, you know, they come to the movies and they get interested in the character or turned off by a character. And I felt that that was kind of a bummer. He's a very sympathetic character, very tragic backstory. Um, And his arcs that he's gone through are just like amazing. But Martian Manhunter is equally as tragic. Martian Manhunter was created kind of out of the need because Superman was kind of growing into that, you know, old, wise, Byzantine kind of style sage. And they wanted, and you know, they were really trying to retcon that whole last son of Krypton thing. You can't be the last son of Krypton when you have a dog and a horse and a cat and Supergirl and this and this and that. And so they really reached out and made Martian Manhunter that, you know, sole survivor. Uh, He had an actual family and a wife and had lived a life before he was forced to come to Earth. And um, I think... I lean more towards anti-heroes and things of that nature, but when it comes to this, for me, Martian Manhunter is a really a straight-up hero, and it kind of surprised me that I actually would choose Martian Manhunter over Silver Surfer, just because I've actually been reading the comic books longer, but it's just so fascinating. I mean, outside the New 52 continuity, where they've kind of changed a few things around, I think the original like 80s run was just perfect, and unfortunately, a lot of people didn't kind of agree they because it got canceled, as a lot of things do. But um, interesting backstory. I love the White Martians, classic, classic uh, enemies. Whereas you know, Galactus, this all-encompassing power, you know, cosmic power, it's servit- indentured servitude, just kind of thing. Just after a while, kind of just you know gets old whereas martian manhunter can be done over and over over again and i was so excited well I, I won't lie when supergirl and they said hey ken Chan, i was like oh yeah cyborg superman and then his eyes went red that one time i was like oh no they're going for martian manhunter yes and <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean i think that um i'm really happy with that and that it's a new chance to do over martian manhunter although they really didn't need to because his appearance in smallville was actually really favorable and a lot of people enjoyed both the actor and the character and getting to know a little bit about that character so i'm glad to see that you know they're trying to go that route again he also now has his own um comic book solo comic book again um and they have a lot of faith because they keep putting cameos of everybody in them to try to get people to read it so i'm really happy that they seem to have a turnaround on it whereas silver surfer i feel like he's kind of on the in the decline but he's still interesting i mean like back in what 2011 he was ranked like 41 which is really good for kind of this esoteric kind of silver blob (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, uh, hands down for me, it's Martian Manhunter, uh, just because of his, for me, what edges it out is his live action uh, iterations right now uh, that are really fascinating. And he has just a lot of really cool motivations. And he actually joined Justice League, which, you know, also fleshed out his character a little more. And you could see his interactions (laughs) or, you know, lack thereof or, you know, tragic decisions. And I think that that's just a little more interesting than somebody floating around from town to town, as it were. Uh, Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. How many more minutes? Have, well, what's my time? You got 17 seconds left if um, you want to. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. All right, Charlie. Yes. yes. So, in response, and and uh, and and again, again, I, I have to say, I find it fascinating that you know Lilith has to keep on going back to the live action versions and anything but the comic books to explain why these characters are stronger. But. <laughs> to their multifaceted i know i know i know i'm come on i'm making this like a real political debate i'm <laughs> well don't go to I'm the bathroom charlie <laughs> your time's it's your disgusting time's, you know your time's know. going mr trump <laughs> okay no um well here's what i'll say about the silver surfer and this i think is 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 why he is a a a, a stronger character the martian manhunter at the end of the day he's he's he he's a being he's he's a he's a living person he has a place even though he is an alien he is an organic alien among other organic beings he's on a planet with other aliens that are also organic that are that can have relationships that can be in this world and participate and be a part of it the silver surfer because of what he has become when he leaves um um Zenla, when he leaves his home planet and becomes bound to the power of Galactus, he ceases to be in any way human. And it is the loss, it is not only that he has lost his home world, it is not only that his home world is gone, it's that even if he can return to it, he cannot be a part of it. You know, I mean, that, and, you know, with the most recent reiteration of Martian Manhunter, I guess they brought Mars back in it, you know, um, and that has caused its own tragedy for um, John Jones. 
but um, for for um, for the Silver Surfer, he had to choose to leave his world to save that world. So first off, he makes the choice. He saves his entire planet by being by not by by sacrificing not just himself and his life, but his very sense of being. His entire existence gets altered in such a way that not only can he not go home again, he can never be at home anywhere. The most he can ever hope to have is some, you know, temporary distraction of a life. He can never have a true life. I think that this is why I think when uh, Mobius did the Silver Surfer back in, uh, I believe it was the late 80s, early 90s, and it was this really touching take on the character because, of course, at, in that world, after all the other heroes have gone and the Silver Surfer is the last last hero left on this planet Earth where he is stuck and he's just a homeless guy living on the street until Galactus returns to essentially trick the world into destroying itself so that he can then devour it. You know, it, it emphasizes how lonely and how separated from anything the Silver Surfer is except when he can become a hero. That when he becomes a hero, that is the one time he is truly Norn Rad again. Because Norn Rad opens as a hero. He starts as a hero. A man willing to give up everything to save those he loved. And now, even though he can never be a part of the world, he still sacrifices himself every time he enters into that world to protect it, knowing that he can never, ever be a part of it again. And for me, that's why Silver Surfer is the superior uh, alien, last alien lost on on the human world, and I relinquish the, the remainder of my time. Whole nine seconds. Okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna make me cry. I think Charlie got that one. There you go. Uh, uh, emotions, one- boo. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta use all the tricks of uh, of, of of debate there, Lilith. You gotta you got you gotta you gotta throw a little mud, then you gotta tug at the heartstrings. <laughs> all right, so right now it's two to one, Charlie. Uh, so let me see. So Charlie will be up first. Uh, nope, already did that one. Okay, Charlie Esser. Who is Marvel Comics equivalent of Wonder Woman? Mm. Well, this one's actually very easy because I've already touched on it. Um. You know, I, as I was debating this, there's, there's a lot of good arguments for who should be Marvel Comics Wonder Woman. But you have to come back to what makes Wonder Woman Wonder Woman. And, um, you know, she, she's a warrior woman. And so, of course, you have um, uh, someone like Lady Sif. Lady Sif, I think, is the strongest argument for a Marvel Wonder Woman up until the current Thor. With the current Thor, we have a real, a real Marvel Comics Wonder Woman. She is both a being who is separated from the world that she's protecting. She is of Asgardian, she is an Asgardian being, and so she is separate from the world. But because she's also Jane Foster, she is also bound to this world. And also because she is an exile from Asgard under, under Odin's current rule, she has no real place to be home. And I think that is really the strength of the Wonder Woman character. Not only that she is a strong woman, not only that she is an Amazon, but that she can never truly be home on Paradise Island because she has been outside of it for too long. She, she, you know, uh, her origin story, Wonder Woman's, is you know she sees the battle of World War or you know, World War Two, probably World War One in the in the new movies. Um, uh, but she sees the the dogfight. She sees um, uh, Colonel Trevor, right? Yes, <laughs> Colonel Trevor, you know, fall from his plane, and she goes and she rescues him, breaking all the rules of her people. Bringing a man onto Paradise Island, you know, utterly, uh, uh, utterly um, earning the ire of those that are of her own kind. And she sees that there is something greater than the paradise of Paradise Island, that they owe it to the world to be fighters, to be warriors, as the Amazons are. But f- not just for the sake of war, but for truth and justice and all these good things. And in the modern Thor... Um, you get all this again. You get this idea of um, an archaic and rigid caste system in, in Asgard under Odin that is seeking to undo all of the changes that have come to the undo all different Marvel Universe. And Thor sits at the center of this as both a symbol of hope and a um, and a, uh, a, a, a bond binding to the traditions of the past world. She is Thor, but she is also something more than Thor. 
And in that, I think that Thor embodies very much what Wonder Woman seeks to be. Uh, it seeks to be not only um, the greatness of the past, but the betterment of the future, both by being bound to the glories of the past and by knowing when we must reject the closed-minded ideas of the powers that be above us, whether that is the patriarchy in the outside world or the matriarchy on Patri Paradise Island, we must be willing to say, we will not uh, bow to that if it is wrong. Only justice is our calling. That is Wonder Woman, that is Thor, and that is my time. Ooh, 20 seconds left, nice. All right, Miss Hellfire, the floor is yours. The short answer is that Marvel absolutely does not have a female Wonder Woman equivalent in terms of origin, power set, and pop culture prominence. Let's just be honest on this one. DC has something that Marvel doesn't, a notable, iconic female superhero that is also a feminist icon as well, and has been regularly promoted since her 1941 debut. She is a bona fide member of the Trinity. She's not to be swept aside. She's had her own TV shows. She's outside of Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man. She is the female comic book character that has appeared in the most comic books. Um, outside of all of that, though, if you just want to like break it down and play devil's advocate, pop culture status overall for me, I'm going to say all you have to do is go to a comic book convention and you'll see the damage score. So obviously I'm talking Captain Marvel. Um, if you want to talk longevity, I'd say Sue Storm, but I will have to kind of say, man, that was much a really big Freudian slip naming your first, technically first superhero woman, Invisible Girl. But it's still better than Millie the model, am I right, ladies? Um, but it is what it is. But Wonder Woman still has 20 years on her, just so we're clear. And if we're strictly talking power and origin, then I think the regular Thor, the male Thor, would be the most logical choice. Um, they have very similar arcs overall, parental issues up the wazoo, and they also have some really unique weapons in the overall superhero arsenal. Um, if we want to do popularity by medium, I would go with the movies. It'd be a tie between Black Widow and Jean, well, three-way tie, Black Widow, Jean Grey, and Storm. If we're talking current comic books right now, I would probably have to say, just based on sales, Captain Marvel. And if we're talking the cartoon animated universe, um, in the 90s, I'd say it'd be a tie between Jean Grey and Storm. Uh, right now, they pretty much just push teams as far as I'm aware, and they're more aimed at like the tweens and preteens and things of that nature. So I don't really watch those unless I'm babysitting. Uh, but yeah, they're mostly like teams, like uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and like the Hulk team and things like that. So it's not a lot of like female representation in those as far as I know. So that's why I stuck with the 90s on that particular thing. Um, so yeah, and I honestly think that when it comes to this debate, the problem is that the Marvel that we like know as today really didn't become like Marvel until 1961. And don't give me that DC didn't come become DC until 1977. They had been using uh, the DC Superman DC monikers since 1940. Time. <laughs> wow. Oh crap. Uh, She's good. She got all, all the facts there, man. Ends are both good. I'm just like, how oh, this is this is a hard one. Um. <clears throat> but hmm. well, I think I'm gonna have to go with the one who who mentioned the thought I had. Um, well, little if you mentioned Captain Marvel, so I think I have to give it to you. And I mean, I, I love Captain Marvel. I was on late in the damage score is awesome, but like. Uh, that that's a toughie you know what i mean like for me i was mm -hmm. definitely like i really hated the way they went about with the character of jean gray like she was my favorite like i have a lot of the classic 60s uh x-men stuff and miss when she was miss marvel she was my jam and that arc that they gave her just ticked me off to no end but i have high hopes for black widow and maybe they'll have a black widow and Wasp movie one of these days yes and and i i will give you that you know marvel does not have um the, does not have a true wonder woman in, in the way that that DC does have this iconic, um, this iconic character who is the, the you know the the female founding member of the Justice League who is on par with Superman in in every way. Um, <clears throat> although I will say they never made they never declared that Janet Van Dyne was the secretary of the Avengers. So, I know, I know. Don't even get me started on that, really. <laughs> so, you know, it's always good to, 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 to you know, we, we, can, we can rip on Invisible Girl, but she was never officially the secretary of the Fantastic Four either. <laughs> uh, all right, so the score is tied at two. No, I'm not rigging this. These two are just that good. All right, so Lilith, you're first this time, right? Okay, who do we have left? Okay, I'm, what? What do we even have left at this point? We have two questions left that unless we get unless we tie it up and go to the uh, wild card. Okay. But I are I already rolled, so your topic to begin with, uh, Miss Hellfire. 
Lex Luthor versus Norman Osborn. Oh, mm. goody. Okay, now this is really actually a tough one for me because I love gingers. Anybody that knows me knows I love gingers, and technically both Lex Luthor and Norman Osborn are gingers. <laughs> but I don't call myself the female Lex Luthor on a bad day for nothing. I think that Lex Luthor is epic, and like this actually probably has a lot to do, like I said, DC got started a long time ago, and Lex Luthor is just an iconic household name, even though Spider-Man 1 and The Amazing Spider-Man both gross more than Man of Steel um, and Superman Returns. Uh, I still think that Lex Luthor is a household name. His arcs alone are epic. Even his most recent one, which I absolutely love, my favorite one, uh, is when he became president. That was amazing. I think that he is the most realistic supervillain outside of like his war suit and stuff like that. I think that that's the most chilling thing about Lex Luthor is that he could be he could be an actual person in the real world. And uh, he's easily the most relatable supervillain. Like he hates Superman because he is an alien. He is an outsider. He thinks that he is standing up for humans and, you know, our, our advancement outside of anybody else's. And I just find that very fascinating. Whereas Norman Osborn is my favorite over the top supervillain. I mean, he dresses as a green goblin <laughs> for goodness sakes. And that origin story in and of itself is amazing. But like I said, Lex Luthor, just hands down household name, uh, great comic book arcs uh, outside of just being president though. Um, he can go toe to toe um, mentally with uh, Batman. Uh, he gives every single person that he runs into a run for their money. Whereas Norman Osborn is just kind of at this point a caricature. <laughs> and that's unfortunate. Um, and I think that the movies had a lot to do with that, uh, people's perception of that. But I still think that Norman Osborn is a good character. Um, if you even want to get into like Lackeys, come on, Mercy Graves versus <laughs> Smythe, come on. <laughs> Hands down, I'd rather have my girl Friday kick some guy's butt than a guy just kind of <laughs> no, Wayland Smithers-esque <laughs> rolling after me, I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 that's really a tough call, but for me, it's always going to be Lex Luthor. Just on sheer name brand recognition alone. I think people could call that. I'm good. All right. All okay. right, Mr. Esser. <clears throat> well, first off, it's not uh, Mercy versus Smythe. It's Mercy versus Victoria Hand. Thank you very much. And I think oh. Victoria Hand, hey. I think Victoria Hand can pretty much stand up to anyone. Okay, uh, but this isn't this isn't Mercy versus Victoria. This is Lex versus Norman. And um, I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you that you know one thing anyone will ever say about DC, even a Marvel fan, is DC has great villains. And I think when you're facing off against villains, DC gets that edge. They have the name recognition and uh, the creative power of just interesting characters to have. But of course, it's important to remember that. Most of what we think about in Lex Luthor is the Lex Luthor of, you know, John Burns run. It is the millionaire Lex Luthor. It is the, um, you know, the, the power of money Lex Luthor. And granted, he's, he's still a genius. He's still a, a, a creative genius. Although I think in some iterations they've downplayed that less. He's been less of the super genius and more of the um, super businessman. Um, but but I'm here to defend uh, Norman Osborn. And in Norman Osborn, we actually get what I think is one of the most interesting melding of classic villainy tropes that you're ever going to see. First off, he has that money. And he is the first millionaire supervillain who isn't directly facing Tony Stark. Um, he is, and actually really, he is the real first millionaire supervillain. You can say Dr. Doom, but really, Dr. Doom is the dictator of a country. Norman Osborn, he's a self-made man. He is a scientist. And he is, in many ways, I would say, the father of our modern Lex Luthor. He is the guy who is monomaniacally obsessed with a hero who is using his business uh, wealth and power to unseat that hero, to mark that hero as, as a villain. And, you know, granted he fails, but, you know, at the same time, he succeeds amazingly as well. You can talk about Lex Luthor as president. I think Norman Osborn as the head of Hammer as the head of the global peacekeeping organization is a far more powerful position to put a psychotic madman in. And, um, and of course it unravels as all villains uh, plans unravel. But I think that Norman strikes the ground in such a powerful way, both in the fact that he is this, this industrialist, he is this uh, man of, of, of monomaniacal power. And he is a guy who is seeking to destroy his petty, his petty villain. It, 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 it's something that is, um, I think, runs a little deeper than Lex Luthor. Because Lex Luthor, whatever you want to say, his, his powers, his motivation against um, Superman, 
depending on where you're going with it, it's either because he was driven insane by an action of Superman, i.e. the chemicals that made him lose his hair, or he's simply a man who is filled with rage at the idea of the most powerful being in the, on his planet being an alien. Norman Osborn is just crazy. And just being crazy and petty and monstrous. He is like, you know, to, to say that, yes, um, DC has great villains. Norman Osborn is the Joker mixed with Lex Luthor. Um, it, is, it, it is taking all the best parts of the Joker, the chaos, the madness, the, the willingness to just throw himself all in and be, mon- be a monster to the world, and mixing it with Lex Luthor's oh. quiet power behind the scenes. All right. Finally, one of you took your time, <laughs> took the whole time. All right. I think, think, I think I have my winner on this one. Talk to the hand, Victoria hand. Charlie, I'm giving you that one. All right. <clears throat> so it's three to two, Charlie. So Charlie takes this next one. He wins it. If Lilith takes it, we're going to go to the wild card. So, all right. Charlie, you're up first with our last regular topic Avengers versus Justice League. You have to be detailed oh, okay. about before we start time on that. You let us explain our rosters and then go. I think would be fair. Wait, okay. Wait, explain your your uh, explain your rosters before we start it. Okay. So would I have to pick a specific Avengers and then she's gonna? I mean, that's, that's the way I did it. I don't know how you did it. Oh, I thought it was just as a as a superhero concept. Um, okay, but I can well, do that. So, so you know what? Let's go with let's. Let's let's okay, okay. so yeah, I was time. um well so or I uh, mean if you want to mix, mix and match however you want to however you want to do it. But, well, in looking at the event, so in looking at the Avengers, let's be honest, the Avengers are never going to be. So you know what? I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to pick I'm I'm going to go with Cap's Kooky Quartet, which is Cap, Hawkeye, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. And I'm going to go with them specifically because any Justice League, just by power, is gonna is gonna dominate the Avengers. You know, anytime you have a Superman, everybody else is just sort of there to to play. You have a Superman and a woman, Wonder Woman, and you're gonna throw in a Martian Manhunter and a Flash just for fun. You know, you, you, you're you're just talking about a, a power structure that nobody can stand up to. You know, I mean, they, like, I, like I always say, they just you know they bring Batman along just so that people have someone to talk to. <laughs> but. Um, but that, but that's okay because it's always going to be that with the Justice League. They're always going to be the, the the these gods among men, powerful beings wandering the earth and doing as they see see fit. What is great about Cap's Kooky Quartet? What is great about the most depowered super team that you can find? Captain America, peak human abilities, but still just human abilities. Hawkeye, really good at shooting arrows. You know, our our, our real superpowers are are. Scarlet Witch, who, of course, granted, is now officially an Omega level woman, uh, mutant, and, and of course, um, uh, Quicksilver, who, of course, has super speed, which is the one superpower that really, really hard to overcome. Um, in being this, I want to say that this is the better team because, first off, in, in Cap's Cookie Quartet, they made a point to put in a female character who was the powerhouse, who is the powerhouse of the team. The Scarlet Witch is, without a doubt, the most powerful character in this. And even though, yes, it's in the 60s, and they're got to deal with all the 60s uh, madman uh, bullpucky that you're going to have in anything from the 60s, you still have someone saying, but our most powerful character is the female. And that's amazing. There are also mutants, which in this, which is as close as comic books could get to actually having black superheroes at the time. These are people who are hated and ostracized from their, from their society and their community just because of who they are. Um, and the racial council with mutants is, is very strong. You compare that with the very, very white, very, very, um, very mainstream Justice League. I think you, you have to say the Avengers are the better team as a story, as a character, as a symbol than the Justice League. The Avengers are people brought together by chance who are going to do good in a world that can at one time hate them dislike them, distrust them. And of course, at, it, with the founding of Cap's Cooking Quartet, he's, it, it's people looking at him and saying, Cap, how can you associate yourself with terrorists, these mutant terrorists, with this criminal Hawkeye, who of course has been, had been giving 
um, uh, Tony Stark so much trouble and was, quite frankly, in league with the Russians, we, we, we imagine. And Cap is standing there as this guy who is the old line hero, you know, and he's saying, no, trust me. These are good people. These people are heroes. And I'm going to show you that they can be the greatest heroes in this world. We are the Avengers, and the Avengers are more than just who we are. We are a group of people who are, who are the heroes of, of this world. We are, we are not the strongest people. We are going to face people that are a thousand times stronger than us every single day. But we're going to fight, and we're going to fight for you, even if you hate us. Hmm. There you go. Okay, All right, Miss Hellfire. I took a really like beat that. <laughs> oh, I will. don't worry about it. Um, I took a really like <laughs> crazy approach to this question, just to be fair to Marvel. Um, I use the um, MCU's uh, Avenger roster, which of course is uh, Hawkeye, Black Widow, Captain America, Thor, Hulk, and Iron Man. And then I went with the like most known uh, JLA, which is Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, Hal Jordan as Green Lantern, Barry Allen as The Flash, and Martian Manhunter. Now, easily hands down, I could just go, oh, they have Batman. Batman has a contingency plan for the JLA, so he could easily formulate something like that for each of the Avengers and go, boom, done. But I won't do that. I actually went through and I used the power grid conversion scale for everybody, and I kind of came up with this formula. Um, I based it on uh, quite a few criterions, uh, criterions actually. Uh, I started with the ranks in IGN's top 100 comic book characters. Um, then I went on the intelligence scale, you know, speed, sh- strength, energy projection, fighting ability. Yeah, I'm a nerd. I play D&D and stuff like that. Don't judge me. Um, so here we go. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. We'll start on the DC side. Superman, of course, is the number one uh, ranked superhero in that IGN poll. We have Batman uh, at number two, Wonder Woman at five. Um, sorry, Barry Allen, you were 49. Ironically enough, Hal Jordan, the thorn in my side, was number seven. Aquaman was number uh, 52. Yay for him. Um, and Martian Manhunter was 43. So that's kind of low on that scale. Um, let's see. Iron Man came in at 12. Thor came in at 14 for that one. And then Hulk came in at 9. Captain America came in at 6. Hawkeye came at 44. And Black Widow came at 74. And Spider-Man came in at number 3. So they kind of... Um, you know, and then we have Thor, who can actually, when it comes to speed, he has traveled at three times the speed of light, unless that's changed. Uh, uh, but we still have the Flash, so, you know, fastest man alive, he's going to win that. I just think pound for pound, yeah, they're like gods among men, but when you equal out the playing field with intelligence and weaponry, it is actually a pretty kind of sort of fair fight. But uh, I don't know, like I said, we have Batman, and Batman has a contingency for everything, so... But um, I really found it really interesting when you uh, add up all these scores and things like that. Uh, the Justice League still wins, but it's not by, like, a lot. It's by, like, four and a half points, uh, if you guys know anything about the power grid skills and stuff like that. So, yeah, I actually did try to be fair about it. And I will actually put it in the show notes for you guys to prove it. So if you're interested in that, look forward to that in the show notes. Ugh. And Phil, so I'll show you the work later. <laughs> No, I absolutely believe you. I mean, they're, they're, you know, what, 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 what I'll say is I, I'm surprised you keep on going back to Batman. Is, I, I mean, you've got Superman. <laughs> I'm just saying say, Batman is- has a contingency for everything. That's the people always kind of like give Batman grief, like, oh, you're just a human with a utility belt. But he's like, for me, he's like actually more like Captain America than Superman to me because he's the human, you know, uh, uh, peak perfection and he didn't even need a serum. And, you know, he's oh, petty yeah. no, and things like that. You know what I mean? Come on. He's a little crazy. He's a little kooky. And he absolutely has the best roster of sidekicks ever, even though he's, quote, unquote, a lone detective. <laughs> like, people That's always just kind of sleep on Batman when they come to the Justice League. He's the brains. Wonder, Wo- Wonder Woman's really kind of the heart and actual leader. And Superman's the muscle. Let's just be real. He's there for the muscle. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, this one... I- Everyone excelled at this, but I mean, come on, Charlie. She did the homework. <laughs> she did the homework. I'm not, I'm not denying she did the homework. <laughs> but yes. it, I, 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 I'm, I'm speechless. I have to give this one to Lilith. And yeah. you know what that means? Wild card time. Oh, I didn't really want it to go to wild card. It's so many ways this could go. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was no other way for it to end, quite frankly. This is going to be blood on the sand. And you know, it's it's there's no other way, but there must be one. Come on, be my favorite question. <laughs> be my favorite question. All right, well, I'm gonna flip again to see who goes first. Charlie, call it. I, good or bad? Oh, uh, good. Well, that's bad. Lilith, <laughs> you going first or second? Uh, 
I'll go second. Okay. All right, then. Charlie Esser, you're up. Uh, better conceptualized universe, Marvel's world outside window or DC's modern day gods mythology? Okay. Well, I have to say, obviously, I'm going to be defending Marvel's world outside your window. And the reason why, the reality is, is that, yes, for a lot of, on a lot of levels, DC's system, it's, it's more, it's, it's better from a, from a mass produced comic book sense. You know, you never have to worry about who's the president. You just have to worry about who's mayor of Metropolis or Gotham. You can carry these concepts on for ages. They're timeless and they are separated from society in that way. And that way, it's just good, clean, popcorn fun. And I admire that very much. But what Marvel tries to do, what Marvel wants to do, is not have this be just a myth, just a legend. They want to show how this legend touches your life, how everything that goes on in this world is paralleled in your own world, in your own life, in the way that you see things. And so it's important that the first image we get of Captain America is him socking Hitler in the jaw. It's saying, this is not going to be something that, we're not going to use fake images for this. It's going to be the Ku Klux Klan who comes after the X-Men. It's going to be the Nazis who are going to battle for the next 70 years in one iteration or another. It is going to be the true monsters of the world, because that's where the true villain is. And so in, in saying we're going to commit ourselves to the world outside the window, yes, it causes problems. Yes, it makes for a difficult continuity because you're always having to wander back and say, well, this is this, and this sort of ties into this. And we now have to deal with the fact that, yes, our characters technically should all be in wheelchairs by this point. But it makes for a better story because when you pick up that first comic book when you're a kid, and you see that this isn't taking place in some strange mythic land of Metropolis or Gotham, that this is not a place where Lex Luthor is president. This is a place where Barack Obama or George W. Bush or Ronald Reagan is president, and the good and bad that that entails. This is your world with superheroes, which makes it makes you somehow tighter bound to those superheroes. Those superheroes are very much a part of your world, and you can imagine yourself much more realistically being in that. And of course, because as we've said, DC from a power structure, it is all about power. It is all about these mythic gods, these beings above us, you know, who are, who do not have limitations. You know, the money of Bruce Wayne, the brilliance of Bruce Wayne, the thinkingness and planning of Bruce Wayne cannot be matched in among, by us mere mortals. And yet, you know, and yet, you know, when we, when, when you are, in Marvel, you know, yes, Tony Stark, he's brilliant, he's rich, he is also haunted by his choices and his past, he has problems, he is, he gets cocky and he gets called on it every single day, he is a drunkard at times, and, you know, that flawedness, that humanness of the Marvel heroes, of Spider-Man trying to make rent so his, 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 his invalid aunt isn't kicked out of their home, you know, that is that is the crux of the Marvel story. That is the crux of the Marvel world outside your window. It's not just a world of superheroes. It's superheroes that you could be, and guess what? They're going to have the same problems that you have. And so it's going to be your story. Thank you. Ooh, nice. <clears throat> 16 seconds left. All right. Okay. Miss Hellfire? Um, for me, as a woman and a person of color, I was initially drawn to X-Men. That was the very first comic book I ever read. It was like from 1963, and I think they were going against the Star Jammers. I've absolutely been enamored with X-Men since then, but nothing else has ever resonated. I have given every book a try virtually under the moon for Marvel. And I always just end up going back to either X-Men or Howard the Duck. Don't you judge me, Charlie. <laughs> oh, I love how no judgment for me. <laughs> and so for me, it's really kind of ironic that, you know, I relate most with Superman. Well, early Superman, like in the 80s with the spit curl. He is the ultimate symbol of an immigrant uh, comes and makes good. And that just really resonates with me, even down to his creators. Just two Jewish kids just, you know, out to have fun actually, you know, got to make this iconic guy and Wonder Woman, this really amazing, iconic feminist symbol from, a you know, a guy that was studying psychology back in the 40s and, you know, just had all these really weird ideas and, you know, national publications that out to, you know, really go after that demographic and it's just it's amazing the things that they dc has actually accomplished and i think that um their their world is actually the earth that they live on is actually bigger because they have these made up uh countries i think that it takes me out of the story in marvel it's like oh new york got destroyed again awesome 
um, things like that. It just pulls me out of the story. <laughs> Whereas it's like Gotham or Metropolis can be any big city that I, I've never been to. And they really capture the hustle and the bustle and at times the grittiness and the sadness because I've lived all over the country. And it just, it feels like any town, USA, um, even, you know, Smallville, Kansas, it's very much Iowa, not really Kansas technically, but it's just, I mean, when you just use it as a symbol for anywhere, it's just easier for you to slip into the story. And I just feel like the characters are more relatable. Yes, they're gods, but they have these struggles. Um, what does it mean to, you know, to fit in, to, you know, do the right thing, even though people don't like in the case of Superman and a lot of the stories, like, you know, am I, I'm a god among men and I have nobody to relate to, or, you know, Wonder Woman fighting the patriarchy and the matriarchy, because they're both just, you kind of need both. And uh, it's just, I don't know. Like, Marvel, for, like I said, the only thing that's ever really resonated with me. I mean, Captain America, Man Out of Time, that's not really up uh, to my alley. You know what I mean? I see the people that it resonates with, and it's like, okay, that's good for you. But for me, like, just coming from an outsider perspective or in the U.S. <laughs> or in the world for the most part, it just it's really odd that these uh, pantheon of, like, being like basically gods are more relatable for me than say x-men who you know for the most part were humans and then they got their powers and you know they struggle with what that means to them i just it's kind of odd and for me that's just kind of why dc wins is they just make the the super gods really relatable and you don't have to worry about who's president you can just say oh Luke, Luke, lex Luthor's not president anymore okay and move on i'm done ah uh, crap uh you wanted the job phil <laughs> Yeah, I know. Ugh. You knew the job was dangerous when you took it. That's right. Uh, I have to say this whole this whole thing has been close, especially this this last topic. It's these <laughs> these two are are equal in passion and I'd say knowledge, and it, it's just probably just comes down to my pre preferences most mostly. I mean, they, it, both of these people have convinced me, have changed my mind, and convinced me of their points of view on many occasions. So. I was intrigued what would happen here, but uh, all right. If I have to make a decision because we need a winner, all right. All I have to say is for someone who isn't a big fan of emotion, you sure do know, know how to play them. Uh, Miss Lilith Hellfire, I think I have to pronounce you the winner. Ah, oh, it was a good game though, Charlie. I can't wait yeah, to do it again. We it have was, so many things to talk about. So close. No being beat by the best. And I hope you remember that the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully people will send in more questions and make it even tougher for us and make it tougher for Phil. Yeah, well, I hope you like I really enjoyed debating you, Lilith. This was a lot of fun. And, oh, you uh, honestly, you I, 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 you convinced me a couple of times, so I, I will say that. I'm just going to say, when you came on Big Picture Radio, you absolutely blew me away with your Ant-Man uh, knowledge. Like, wow. Because, come on, let, let, like, who's really checking for Ant-Man? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you really did blow me away on that one. Well, thank you. And you've always blown me away. Every podcast I've ever heard you on, Lilith. Uh, it, it's always an honor to be to be in your presence. Awesome. I feel the same way. I can't wait to do it again. Seriously, guys, send in tougher questions. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Um, you could send your questions that any of these, uh, any way, if you want to, but if you want to specifically talk DC about me and uh, our winner, Miss Lilith Hellfire, you can always email us for uh, World's Finest Podcast, uh, World's Finest Pod at gmail.com. On Facebook, we're World's Finest Podcast. And on Twitter, we're at World's Finest Pod. And if you want to talk Marvel every week with me and Charlie, you can email us Marvel Roundup at gmail.com. Facebook is all new Marvel Roundup. And our Twitter is at Marvel underscore Roundup. And the easiest way to get uh, questions to us. Um, and to talk anything Marvel or DC, you can email me, nightwingpdp at gmail.com. And on Twitter, I am at nightwingpdp. Lilith? Oh, you guys can find me on Twitter at Lilith Hellfire. I'm on Tumblr. It's lilithhellfire.tumblr.com. You can check out one or two of my websites, lilithhellfire.com or popculturepostmortem.com. I just started it, and it's really, really snarky, no holds bar kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, please check it out. And also, if you need news, Channel 52 is the place to be if you're a DC Nation um, resident. And of course, you can always yeah. find me on Twitter at Charlie Esser, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. -E 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 Look for the two E's in the middle. That means quality. And you can write to me at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. And come on, Marvel people, write to me. Let's protest this injustice that we have endured. And or send an idea so that we can <laughs> so we can retake the rightful title back to Marvel on the next show. Oh, uh, you'll you'll get another chance, Charlie, because I think we all agree but we want to do this again, right? Oh yeah, I want to get into that to the Guardians versus. <laughs>
The ah, the watchers, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I was hoping for that one. Yeah. We still have a few things up our sleeve, and uh, remember, send in your qu- if there's anything you want answered, send them in. These two will argue it out. So, 